Welcome from the Scottish Youth Film Foundation Broadcasting Festival of Politics 2024. This year, Scottish Parliament hosts a range of different events, starting with exhibitions, live music and panel discussions. Ourselves and three other Scottish Youth Film Foundation team members will be reporting daily on the One Week Festival, interviewing key figures in politics, science and the arts. And we'll be uploading our show here on the Scottish Youth Film Foundation YouTube channel every day at 7 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time. The first days of the festival are behind us, with diverse panels covering AI, local government and health. However, much more ahead, so don't miss a chance to catch up with the exciting events and stay tuned on our social media. Without further ado, we hope you enjoy today's show. The Festival of Politics is celebrating its 20th year at the Scottish Parliament in Edinburgh, Scotland. For one week in August, thousands of visitors enter the Parliament to see today's best minds and personalities talk on issues as far-ranging as AI, climate change, housing, the global political landscape and the arts. It's a unique chance for members of the public to meet acclaimed professors, Hollywood actors, activists, politicians and historians. True to its name, there's also dancing, opera, choirs and exclusive exhibitions. A carousel of Scottish thought and expression. It's really unique and it's, it's, it's nice to see the Parliament transformed and it really feels like there's quite, quite a festival atmosphere um, taking place and it's, it's great, everybody seems really happy. Um, and interested in all of the, the different panel discuss discussions that are taking place. So how would you describe the Festival of Politics in three words? I think it's really open. It's, um, Insightful. It, it's great that it's accessible to everybody, open to all. Uh, discover. Educational. <laughs> it's open for everybody. It's equal. Really interesting. Today it's really sunny, it's bright um, and just full of enthusiasm. That was more than three words, apologies. <laughs> this year also celebrates the 20th anniversary of the iconic Scottish Parliament building. Designed by award-winning Spanish architect Enrique Morales, its cutting-edge infrastructure and open access design serve as beacons for how politics should be done in the 21st century. Now both 20 years old, the Scottish Parliament and the Festival of Politics are the engines of political life here in Edinburgh and on the global stage. To find out more, visit festivalofpolitics.scot or the Scottish Parliament website. There's so many topics that are being explored. There's really something for everybody as part of the, the Festival of Politics. Oh, so what a great start we've had to the Festival of Politics. So a lot of the training has been very technical. How have you guys handled the tech? I mean, we, we had a lot of help from our team and from our tutors, so we've got really good uh, training sessions, so yeah, that helps a lot. And Sophie? Today I forgot to turn how, forgot how to turn a camera shutter on, <laughs> um, but other than that, it's been fine. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been a very fast-paced environment, especially in the editing room. Have you guys been stressed at all and how have you dealt with the stress so far? Um, how? Dealing. It's, it's been different, not something I'm used to, but I think it will get easier as the week goes on. Mm -hmm. there, wa there was a lot of stress, but at the same time, it was exciting and uh, you're such, I don't know, you're um, scared, but at the same time, you know what to do and how much time you need to do that, so you have no chance to... Uh, not think about it. Yeah, yeah. Just think about it. So yeah, it just uh, yeah. Um, so yesterday, the SIF team was lucky enough to meet Jack Loudon, the star of Scottish Stage and Screen. He had a wonderful talk, and our team member Sandy had an exclusive interview with him. In tandem with his return to theatre in the Fifth Step, as well as Slow Horses Series Four, Jack Loudon joined us today at the Festival of Politics to discuss his career as well as his views on the current state of the arts industry. I was very fortunate in many ways that I'd, I, I had... Uh, my, my mum and dad worked their back, backsides off to, to help me and my brother do what we do. And it's, you know, sometimes 
there's certainly certainly when it comes to the Bali world, you know, the, there's there's a lot of travelling and things like that. So there, but it does it does cost money. It can cost money, but it can oh, you can do it without doing it that way. Every every time I work on a production, whether it's a film or a play, like I'm working, there's there's people that have gone to private schools and had every chance under the sun and everything for them and people that have gone that, that haven't had any of those opportunities and they both seem to be arriving at the same point now at the beginning at the grassroots level i think there definitely isn't the same uh, access to stuff like that which is why drama dra- not just drama you know like music and the arts art in general but drama should become a so- a, a something that is offered to children anywhere it should be in state schools from in the same way that, you know, I, I remember being at primary school and being taught French, you know, but not taught drama. And both of them have equal importance. Um, so I think that the only way to do that is to make sure it's in national curriculum. That's the only real way. You can try and look for more money and more subsidy into, into sort of community projects that do it. You know, there's a there's a there's a place in Derby that has seemed to at one point produce some of the best actors working in the UK. All of a sudden, there's a director called Shane Meadows, a brilliant filmmaker, and all these actors came out of nowhere because he just started to run a free, you know, uh, workshop. I think, and I've worked with about five of them: uh, Jack O'Connell, Ashley Loftus. I've I've worked with them. Um, but at the same time, I've worked with people that you know have gone like Eton and Cambridge and blah 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 blah. Um, I think the important thing is is that that I I went to I went to a state school, both state schools, and I was just happened to be very lucky to go to the school that had it didn't have drama at that point. I had a music teacher that really liked putting on big shows, so that was lucky. And also, like I say in in the borders, amateur operatics, where I was I was on I was stood on stage with like retired policemen, teachers, everybody. Um, and like that's that is I think we paid I can't remember it's been so long now I think you paid a Jew you did pay some kind of Jews or something like that um, but that they're absolutely what I'd always be careful of is because that point is brought up quite a lot is that it is it, that there is an issue but that is an issue in every walk of life. We caught up with him to discuss those issues further. So you've starred in a variety of high-grossing films. What's prompted your return to theatre? It's what I love doing, first and foremost, and I haven't done it. Uh, I've done one play in about ten years, so it's it's. If I could, it's all I'd do because I just love it so much. Um, but I've also fallen in love with making films, so um, I'm spoiled for choice in that regard. But uh, the main reason I did this play is because of the writer uh, David Ireland is one of the best writers we've got, and um, the play is fantastic and odd and mental and terrifying and was a no-brainer really. Let's talk about Slow Horses. Obviously that is a major role for you I can imagine. I sadly don't have Apple TV. Unbelievable. And I'm gutted because I do, I do like a spy drama. One of my, uh, I really loved Spooks when that was on TV. Right. So, well, get um, so yeah. Um, Apple TV then. <laughs> I'll bung you. <laughs> I'd appreciate that. But um, what I was going to ask is, um, obviously, because it, um, obviously there've been a lot of spy dramas around. As I mentioned, Spooks, of course. Of course, James Bond is another big one. Did you research a lot of those when you were pl- when you were playing your character? Or? No, for the no, not at all. I mean, no. I uh, I think the whole point of slow horses is that they are supposed to be recognisable. So I, I think. Um, I mean, the few the few times in my life I've ever actually worked in an office is probably the much the, the most amount of sort of recall I've used from anything. Um, I mean, I, you, the other thing is with espionage, you never know what's actually true. So I don't know what you know. You can get halfway down a rabbit hole and go, "Wait a minute, is that true?" So there was I purposely didn't do anything. I was quite lazy about this. Job. Oh no, 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 quite understandable. Yeah. You have been an ab- advocate, of course, for Scottish independence. Um, in what ways do you think an independent Scotland could benefit our film industry? And are there challenges that you're worried about? I mean, I've not been, I've, 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 I've voted for it uh, 10 years ago now. I, um, I don't know how it would affect the film industry. I think the film industry, 
Film industries, wherever they are in the world, I think, are very... The independent film industries are very, very difficult things to keep alive um, because of the amount of people that are involved and the, 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 the small experience I've had in the other side of the camera in producing is um, it really does all, in the end of the day, come down to money. Can you grab the money? Can you persuade people? Um, so whether or not in an independent Scotland that would make much difference, I don't know. I think the arts is always up against it in whatever the political situation is in any country because it's not always at the top of people's agendas. I don't know if that would necessarily change that. Um, I, think, um, I think we have to just sort of bubble wrap storytellers and the notion of storytellers and hold them on a higher pedestal I think no matter what's going on in the country I think we have to be um, careful that the importance of our industry doesn't just fall down depending on what's happening in a country because it can really change things like you saw with the drama they made about the post uh, office disaster and you know it's always there and people always want to go to it at the end of the day so it's a vital, vital service to me, the, um, the arts. Well, that's perfect. Jack Loudon, thank you very much. No, it's a problem. Well, that was yesterday's event with Jack Loudon at the Scottish Festival of Politics 2024. Um, I can only say, I mean, I, I was in the room. I wasn't actually speaking to him, Santi, but I was starstruck. It was a really big interview. Um, how did you feel about it? Um, I was actually quite scared. Um, <laughs> I mean, obviously, um, before, I, I mean, I studied journalism at university and I have interviewed people like MPs and MSPs and campaigners and whatnot, but Jack Loudon is by far the most famous... He's, Holly he's a Hollywood actor. He's a, he's, a, <laughs> he's a Hollywood actor, a big cornerstone of Scot Scottish popular culture, so I did feel like there was mm. quite a lot of weight on my shoulders, um, understandably. But um, And did you learn some interesting things about him? Well, yeah, um, he's actually a very interesting guy and... By all accounts, Slow Horses is a fantastic, gripping drama. It <laughs> managed to poach a Gary Oldman, a Gary Oldman and Jack Loudon. And um, I do like a, a good spy drama. I was a fan of Spooks when it was on TV. So it was, um, <laughs> as I said um, in the interview. <laughs> as I said in the interview. Um, but um, no, it was absolutely fascinating to meet him. And he um, he seems like a um, he has a lot of radical ideas. ideas. He spoke about. Um, his experience of being a working class actor getting into the field and he advocated strongly for um, drama being more uh, being more accessible in schools and um, teachers um, making as much time for it as even the sciences and STEM. Mm. Um, I think it was in particular for working class Scots, was it? Um, yeah, of course. Um, but I think that's very important that there are people like that in the industry who mm. do advocate for opportunities and regardless of your background um absolutely um obviously industries need a variety of people and i think that diversity really helps build a world yeah um and it was fantastic to hear jack Loudon speaking about that in your interview mm, yeah um, no of course the both of you at the scottish festival of politics and leading up to this event at our training weekend in lag and leah have had to do a lot of interviews you've had to do some vox pops i know myself that's probably the most nerve-wracking thing for me um I just can't approach people in the street, they get scared of the moustache, but <laughs> how's it been for yourselves? Uh, as in approaching people? Well, doing interviews, box pops and so on. Um, um, it, it, it can be very difficult, um, for, especially if you get put on the spot and you're trying to think of things to um, of say, on, uh, say in, the, in the moment, it can be quite difficult. I think the art is to just remain calm, keep the questions simple. Mm. Um, because that will give your interviewee a chance to really open up yeah. about what they're speaking. Keep it broad, yeah. essentially, and that goes for anyone at home who um, thinks about taking journalism. <laughs> um, and yourself, Sophie? I think the phrase, fake it till you make it, is really, really applicable <laughs> when you're interviewing people, um, especially if you are the interviewer rather than the interviewee, because as long as you are calm and confident and you know what you're doing, then the person you're interviewing will respond in kind. Um, I the hardest part, obviously, is reaching out to people and getting them to, you know, answer your emails. Yes, as we found out with our own personal video. So in preparation for this week, each member of the Scottish Youth Film Foundation has been making a short film on a local issue. So 
Myself and Sophie made a video on the new pylon scheme in the Scottish Highlands and Santi, I think you made a video on? Uh, yeah, it was on um, a, it was a piece on 15 minute neighbourhoods that you'll probably be seeing that either tomorrow or Thursday, I'm not sure, check the schedules. <laughs> Once we've um, got the footage done. <laughs> um, it's to do with a, um, a shopping centre in my neighbourhood called Children's Arcade, which is being knocked down potentially at the end of this year in favour okay. of 300 built to rent flats. My question simply is, are we building the sustainable communities that we need? Mm. Um, or is that competing with big money for, say, developer, mm -hmm. developers and sort of private schemes? So We'll be seeing Santi's video later in the week, but right now we've got uh, Amber's video ready on mental health and deprivation in her hometown of Kilmarnock. The Scottish Government has said poverty is the single biggest driver of poor mental health, but what has been done to resolve this? I'm outside one of the three CAM centres for Ayrshire and Arran. This is the North West Area Centre in Kilmarnock, a town which contains some of the most deprived areas in Scotland. This deprivation links to the high rates of suicide seen across Kilmarnock and East Ayrshire. An annual BBC survey conducted for 15 years showed that the worst mental health was reported in people from the most deprived areas in Scotland. Scotland has a high suicide rate in the UK, but this rate in East Ayrshire was above the national average, ranking fifth out of all the local authorities in Scotland. I spoke to Jonathan Cott, a staff nurse at CAMS Ayrshire and Iron, about the poor mental health in this area, particularly for young people. East Ayrshire has one of the highest suicide rates in Scotland. Um, do you see a link between the deprivation here to the poor mental health? Fortunately, with uh, deprived areas, you're going to have unhealthy coping strategies mm -hmm. um, and not all of those are linked to health, but it's your social attachment to it. So you've got, um, if there's a lack of education, a lack of prospects for jobs, um, you'll find young people especially will go down certain routes, which is very hard to change those land behaviours. Do you think that the Scottish Government should focus more on mental health, particularly in deprived areas, mental health, particularly in deprived areas like East Ayrshire? Um, oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I would personally feel that a universal approach across Scotland would be much more beneficial because it allows there to be pilot schemes tried and they can be tried in different areas. Mm -hmm. um, if we can get it right for one area, it should work in other areas. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's not always the case. Kilmarnock was once a thriving industrial town full of restaurants, shops and culture for people to enjoy. Today, it is best known for its deprivation, as shown in the 2010 documentary The Scheme. The scheme showed people living in Kilmarnock who all had a history of alcoholism or drug abuse and many of them had been in prison or experienced homelessness. Whilst it did show a link between deprivation and poor mental health, it resulted in views across the UK judging the people involved rather than looking at why they were in these poor situations. Do you think that the programme, the scheme, was an accurate representation of mental health in Kilmarnock? No, definitely not. Um, I think it allowed people to have an insight into the private area, but the programme focused more on the the day-to-day -day lives of what people were doing and not their struggles. It was sad to see because that is always spoken about in the local areas, it was showed nationwide, it had subtitles, and instead of people having empathy, I thought more people had an approach of, this is quite funny when there's anything but funny about it. What do you hope for the future of mental health in East Ayrshire and the rest of Scotland? I would hope for more additional services, such as we've got a service called Fox Grove opening up. People need to understand these things a lot better. So I think with schooling, there needs to be a real drive in teaching young people in a non-clinical way to teach individuals what they're capable of instead of what they're not capable of. Kilmarnock is set to receive £20 million from the government's levelling up fund, which will go towards improving the town centre. Hopefully, this area will receive more funding towards improving its mental health as well. It's really good that the festival provides us with a chance to cover such important issues in our society. 
So both of you um, covered really different topics with, uh, for Rav, it's electricity pylon line and uh, Amber, it's mental health. So how do you think uh, the topics you, you've covered need more public attention in society right now? Or is anything else you need to, uh, we need to implement to, in order to raise awareness? Um, so I feel like mental health, you know, you always kind of need to raise awareness for that especially with it getting worse and worse in young people. And in my film, I was looking at the link between that and deprivation. And I think that specifically is not really talked about enough. Like, obviously, mental health is a lot worse for people in the most deprived areas, and there's not really enough being done about it or talked about it. So that's why I wanted to do it in the film. Um, as you'll see in our video later this week, um, there's been a strong community response to national infrastructure projects uh, for bringing the UK towards net zero. Um, and it's, it's a big topic at the moment is how we tackle the climate crisis, uh, particularly with quite a, a global or national slant, but it's really the local communities that are affected, um, especially when it comes to renewable energy, because the Scottish Highlands is a major source of it. And um, it's gonna be radically changed in the next few decades. So I think, the views of local people really need to be listened to and considered because there is definitely a sentiment up north that both the Scottish and UK governments and giant energy companies like SSEN um, aren't really listening. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, also a bit about working process. Um, how do you think? Um, were there any challenges you faced while working on your topics and uh, covering your issues? Um, well, I feel like for mine, it was just trying to find people to talk to about it. Um, Same for mine. <laughs> because, like, I talked to someone that works in CAMS, um, but I emailed quite a lot of people, and a lot of people weren't really wanting to talk about it. It's not really a thing, like, in my area, it's not really a thing that a lot of people talk about, so it's just hard to try and get access to that, I guess. Yeah, getting, uh, getting local councils and... Uh, Mm -hmm. board members from energy companies to play ball is pretty damn difficult. <laughs> um, we have challenges with recording over the wind as well. That's one thing that you never think about when making films in Scotland is that the weather is not on your side. <laughs> um, so I'd, yeah, I'd say those were the main challenges really. Uh, we'll be moving forward to the next uh, our film and uh, Amber interviewed the Chief Executive of Voluntary Health Scotland and we'll Tune into it right now. So you're a big advocate for improving mental health through nature. Um, did you ever have a moment yourself where you kind of realise the benefits of this? Or have you just always been someone that goes out into nature a lot? Yeah, I've been really lucky. I guess as a, as a younger person, I grew up in Luton and uh, it's quite an urban area. And culturally, there are not that many Indian families that would possibly spend time outdoors and, and hikes and walks and things. Um, but I was actually introduced to the Scouts at quite an early age. So got involved in kind of hiking and walking as, and camping as part of that. Um, and it still takes me really outside of my comfort zone. That time and opportunity to be in nature, for me, is, it's just so different to the other pressures that we experience in our daily lives. It can be hugely beneficial to anybody, um, regardless of your background. Um, there's something different about being in nature and different types of nature. So you also once said that understanding that we're not alone at times of um, struggle is a comfort and a leveller. What other kind of things do you think about, like if you're struggling or could you tell other people if they're struggling as well? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we've had to experience a lot of difficult things in the last few years. Um, and for people of all ages, there's, there's a lot of pressures out there in terms of COVID and lockdown, financial pressures, all those things that, that make life difficult for us. And I think part of it for me is it's, it's about being kind to ourselves it's just recognizing that there is a lot going on in the world there's a lot going on for us personally and so you know having that understanding and being kind to yourself is a good starting point yeah. um i think that the, the the second part of that is 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 it's really important to recognize that people are there to help experience of that is that as soon as you start to do that 
um, there is a, a, a level of relief that comes with that simple sharing um, with other people. So I'd encourage people to have that conversation. Really excited to join Voluntary Health Scotland. Uh, we're a national organisation and, and with 20 years of experience behind us, uh, we've really built that reputation of being an organisation that wants to deliver change. But the work we want to do moving forward is actually we're at a point where we need to see more of a step change and we need to think outside of the box. So um, what, what I'd like us to be able to do is actually to start to help drive more of that innovation um, you know and to, to, to help shift what we call these kind of the whole systems the health system as a whole what can we do differently to actually make a change here and I see part of that is our ability to help and broker collaboration between third sector organisations within communities um, but also the NHS and our primary care um, provision as well. How can we help those three areas really come together um, which I think is then a much stronger um, support and system for people. So we've just come out of the health inequalities panel. What did you think of it? I thought it was very insightful, very educational and I thought it shows and highlights like, lots of different problems that Scotland is still facing, especially in more deprived areas um, and how they have a harder life. Like It does also show positives, especially in prisons that was highlighted that their prison life is becoming a bit easier and prisoners are getting more access to mental health, which could stop reconvictions in the future. But there are still lots of problems that we need to face. So what do you think of the health inequalities panel today? I thought the panel were absolutely first class. I thought the range of backgrounds they came from and the fact that they all had such a different perspective on a really complex subject was just fascinating. Um, from prisons to um, the minority ethnic issues to um, voluntary health, I thought these were absolutely fascinating. Um, and I think we came to a conclusion at the end, really, that health inequalities are a feature of inequality and that we have to really address the bigger issue to be able to resolve the health inequalities. Well, I think I can safely speak for all of us at the Scottish Youth Film Foundation that it's been a fantastic first day of broadcast at the Festival of Politics. Uh, a particular highlight for me was the food in the MSP's canteen because it's quite a bit better than the public cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Right, so let's have a look at what's coming up over the next week. We will have Sal, who will be covering why we need whistleblowers. And then Amber will be covering 25 years of Scottish Parliament and where the young women are. And finally, I will be delving into the world of deep fake politics and interviewing Hannah Perry and Robert Moran. From all of us here at the Festival of Politics, thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at the same time. Thank you very much everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good night.